My name is Barbara Sanders. I'm the Education Specialist here at Gettysburg National Military Park. And on behalf of the Park Service and the Gettysburg Foundation, I want to thank you so much for coming out here on this very, very special evening for a special presenter. I'm here just to welcome you and to introduce uh, Wayne Motts, the President and CEO of the Gettysburg Foundation, just since uh, about last May. And I want to tell a little story before I introduce him, which brings us here. It's not a bad story. It's a great story. It connects it. It's full circle. I found myself in the upstairs hallway one day last summer, uh, bending Wayne's ear about an issue, which I tend to do from time to time. And, and I began to apologize for it. You know, I was like, Wayne, I'm so sorry. You know, I, I guess I'm a complainer. And then I stopped myself. I said, no, I'm not going to apologize because I'm in the middle of this book that my husband bought for me. It's called The Agitators. It has changed my life because I'm not a complainer. I'm an agitator. That <laughs> <laughs> is what I do. And Wayne said, we're going to get her here. Dorothy, he said, I know exactly what you're talking about. I know the book, and we're going to get her here. And here we are tonight. Um, so um, I'm just so pleased to be able to introduce Wayne, as I said, as you all know, he's the president and CEO of the foundation, our main partner here in the operation of the visitor center and many other sites. Uh, Wayne is also the CEO emeritus of the National Civil War Museum in Harrisburg, an institution that he led for nine years, and the executive director emeritus of the Adams County Historical Society located here in Gettysburg. He's been a licensed battlefield guide at this park for more than three decades. Were you the youngest guy? Is that right? Not youngest ever, but youngest for a while. Youngest for a while. Yes. Youngest, youngest yeah. for a while. <laughs> and and, uh, and he's also the co-author with James Hessler of Pickett's Charge at Gettysburg, a guide to the most famous attack in American history. He's the man responsible for getting us all out this evening uh, and uh, here tonight for this wonderful speaker. So ladies and gentlemen, Wayne Mott. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Barb. Good evening, everyone. And if you're an agitator, I don't know what that makes me. I'll have to ask uh, the rest of the staff. Uh, on behalf of the Gettysburg Foundation, we want to thank our partners, the Gettysburg National Military Park, uh, for co-sponsoring this event with us. Uh, I also want to say that we're grateful that all of you came out here this evening. And I have a, just a couple of housekeeping measures I'd like to do before I introduce our speaker this evening. First of all, if you have a cell phone, please either turn it to silent or off so we don't have interruptions. Also, we ask, obviously, that this not be recorded. Not sure if anybody's using phones here, but we are going to record this. We will have it, and it will be posted at no charge on the uh, Gettysburg Foundation's YouTube site uh, later on for everybody to go ahead and watch. We thought this would be a great presentation for Women's History Month, and I'm so honored this evening to be able to introduce our keynote speaker, Dorothy Wickenden. And I got a couple of things I want to say about Dorothy, and I have it on a sheet of paper to make sure I don't get it wrong uh, here this evening. So Dorothy has been the executive editor of the New, York, New Yorker magazine since 1996. She joined the magazine as managing editor in 1995. And she's also the moderator of a weekly podcast on NewYorker.com called The Political Scene. A Neiman Fellow at Harvard in 1988 to 1989. Dorothy was the National Affairs Editor at Newsweek between 1993 and 1995. And before that, she spent 15 years at the New Republic as Managing Editor and later as Executive Editor. She edited the New Republic Reader, 80 Years of Opinion and Debate, and she is the author of Nothing Daunted, The Unexpected Education of Two Society Girls in the West. She's a New York Times bestselling author, and tonight she's going to talk about the title that Barb just mentioned called The Agitators, that also has a connection here to the Battle of Gettysburg. So I want to thank my staff for all the preparation here at the Gettysburg Foundation to get Dorothy here. And I want to thank Dorothy and her traveling companion, her husband Ben, for coming out and being with us this evening. So please help me welcome Dorothy Wickham to the <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Let me see if I can put the mic back because I'm going to need all my hands here. Um, thank you so much. So. Yeah, it's not that easy, that? right? <laughs> thank you so much, Barbara and Wayne, and thank you all for coming. I just can't tell you, after doing almost two years of uh, Zoom talks about this book, I really like seeing live audiences, and I love, I love the electricity in the room. It's just great. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to be talking to you tonight from Gettysburg, and I can't resist starting off with a story about how I first met Wayne Motts, probably some 30 years ago. My husband and I, we probably weren't even married at the time, just we happened to be driving down to Philadelphia and we thought, why don't we just stop in Gettysburg and take a look at the battlefield? And we were lucky enough to be put in the hands of this extremely young, very energetic, very knowledgeable tour guide. Wayne Motts. And we just had, it was just a transforming experience. I, it got me so excited and interested in the Civil War about which I knew nothing. And I, when I was right, finally, all these years later, I'm writing this book and I suddenly thought, I wonder what ever happened to Wayne Motts. And, and here he is. And so I, I wrote, I emailed him and I said, hi, Wayne, you won't remember me, but I, you know, all these years ago, Ben and I, you know, you gave us this story. He said, of course I remember you. And then I said, well, do you think you'd mind reading my chapter? I'm writing a book about the Civil War. Would you mind reading my chapter about Gettysburg? And he did. And of course he had incredible, incredible help to offer. So uh, it is just reconnecting with him. He's now a grandfather. I mean, it's really kind of incredible. And the president of the Gettysburg Foundation. It's really been one of the great pleasures of working on this book. So I am asked a lot about how I got onto the story of these three women. And I was asked again tonight. And so I will tell you, uh, my grandmother, Dorothy Woodruff, my namesake, grew up in Auburn in upstate New York, and it was just a few generations after the protagonists here. I had never been to Auburn, but I was researching a little bit of, about it and had to talk to some people up there, and I wanted to know if one of the things she said in her oral history was correct, which was that her grandparents lived next door to William H. Seward, the Secretary of State to Abraham Lincoln. So I went to the Seward House Museum to check it out, and I was quickly told, yes, that's right. But writing is a serendipitous process, and much more importantly, when I was there and given a tour of the museum, I found out that his wife, Frances Seward, conspired in the 1850s with two devoted friends, Martha Coffin Wright, who lived around the corner, and Harriet Tubman, to overturn slavery and win equal rights for women. And after the war, Harriet Tubman moved to Auburn and spent almost 50 years of her life there. So as I finished Nothing Daunted, I kept thinking about the story of these women and wondering, I just, I just couldn't get out of mind, my mind. How did Harriet Tubman end up spending all those years in upstate New York? She grew up on the Eastern Shore, enslaved, of course. So I began to poke around the archives, and I quickly discovered that I couldn't answer the question without understanding this extraordinary collaboration with Seward and Wright. And I soon realized that the story had never been told. So I'm a journalist. I couldn't resist. I jumped into it. And then, you know, I'm writing about the 19th century, but I kept getting struck by how contemporary the themes were. And this grew over the years. The book took seven years to write. So here are some of the themes. The routine abuse of women, endemic racism, grassroots activism, a politically polarized society teeter teetering on the edge of what people today are calling the next civil war. And so I've come to think about this book almost as much about what is taking place now as about the revolutionary events of the 19th century. A few years ago, the civil rights leader, leader, great civil rights leader, Representative uh, John Lewis, wrote, just before his death, democracy is not a state. It is an act. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call 
good trouble, necessary trouble. The protagonists of the agitators were ordinary people. They were actually just women, and one of them was a black woman, of all things. No, you know, not, no, no power in their, their society at all when they got into what they saw as necessary trouble. And it was inconceivable that they would ever remotely succeed in what they set out to do. And as you'll see if you read the book, they went a long way toward accomplishing their goals. My first contact with Frances Seward, there she is, is a young woman, not long after she was married, was a letter to her husband. There's Henry Seward, as she called him by his middle name. And it was a letter that Frances wrote to him in 1831, when she was a young wife and mother. She was still living in her childhood home with her father, her grandmother, and her aunt, along with her husband and children. Um, it's today the Seward House Museum, which I visited, and that's what it looked like at the time. Beautiful house. And she wrote to her husband in desperation to say that her sister Lizette was being beaten by her husband, Alva Warden. He turned on Francis, too. And so she's writing this in, her, in the, this letter, which I read when I was in the Seward House Museum. My own dear Henry, she wrote, calling him by his middle name, Warden has turned me out of the, the house and abused me in every possible way. He snatched away the book she was reading, Francis was reading, and threw it across the room, swearing at her and ordering her to go home. Lizette wept as Warden grabbed their daughter, who screamed for her mother. Lizette told Francis that she would do anything to get away from Warden, even cross the ocean if she could take her daughter with her. But she was trapped. Women had no legal rights. When they got married, by law, they were the property of their husbands. If they'd gone into marriage with an inheritance, as Lizette had, they had no access to it. Her husband was drinking away her, her inheritance. They couldn't sit on juries, make a will, sign a contract, or file a lawsuit. And of course, they couldn't vote. If a woman pursued divorce, she became a pariah and lost everything, her children, any financial support, and her reputation. Frances thought that in such cases, women should have the right to divorce and to custody of their children. An unspeakable idea at the time, literally. She wrote, men have framed laws, I believe, to uphold themselves in their wickedness. Unable to help Lizette, she had to ask her husband to come home and, and do it for her. A few years later, she had another epiphany about social injustice. Her, her health wasn't good, and so her doctor advised her and Henry to take a summer trip, and they did. They went down to the south in the summer of 1835, and she wrote in her journal about one day in Virginia when they stopped at a tavern north of, of Richmond. They heard the sound of weeping and moaning and saw ten naked little boys tied together by their wrists and fastened to a long rope. They watched with horror as a tall white man holding a whip Leaded them, led them to a horse trough to drink, and then into a shed where they lay down, sobbing themselves to sleep. They asked about it, and they learned that they were being taken to Richmond, where they would be sold at auction. Just a few of the tens of thousands of people that Virginia sold to the Deep South every year. Frances just couldn't get over this. She was very sensitive, um, very, very, very attuned to other people's troubles. Fran Even though she had grown up in this incredibly aristocratic household, she wrote in her journal, slavery, slavery, the evil effects constantly coming before me and marring everything. And she returned to Auburn a committed abolitionist. I thought this was incredible material viscerally exposing the deepest fractures in American democracy. Yet no one had ever written about Francis. William Seward's first biographer, I started with him, Glyndon Van Dusen, who published his book in 1965, dismissed Francis in three words, a neurotic invalid. She suffered from what today would be called migraine headache, diagnosed as clinical depression and migraine headaches. And she was an avowed homebody, partly because of her health, so what could she possibly have to say that would be of interest to anyone? That everyone just assumed nothing. 
Subsequent biographers did quote her selectively and sometimes described her as more radical than her famous husband, who was anti-slavery. But I discovered when I went to look at the Seward Papers at the uh, University of Rochester, where they're archived, that Francis's letters were still essentially untouched. And a curator there told me that when they were donated to the library, they were set aside as worthless. Boxes and boxes of letters that nobody ever bothered to look at. To me, of course, they were a gold mine. Francis wrote to Henry in Washington several times a week, and she just felt eerily alive, again, with these very contemporary-seeming themes, two centuries later. So as I said, her father was very wealthy, and she was unusually well-educated for a woman of that era. She read everything from Thucydides to abolitionist leaflets. The notorious Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 allowed slave catchers to travel to free states to hunt down runaways and required citizens and police to deliver suspected fugitives to federal commissioners. Frances knew she had to violate the law. She just needed to figure out how. Henry was a senator by then, and she started by becoming his private political advisor. She insisted on staying in Auburn when he moved to Washington. So that's what Washington looked like at the time. Pennsylvania Avenue, basically mud, and the, the, the dome of the Capitol, which wasn't finished for quite a few years. And from Auburn, she began to, uh, delivering regular reports to him about how people in the state were rebelling against that law. They didn't want these people from the South coming up and, and pulling you know, their neighbors out of their homes and, and sending them back into slavery. She clipped and saved key lectures as well by abolitionists in Boston and elsewhere. And for more than a decade, she told them he must listen to what they were saying. She had married Francis when she was only a girl. She was 19 years old, and he was an exceedingly ambitious 24-year-old lawyer. She, nevertheless, she'd assumed that they'd just live a quiet life in Auburn, reading together, working in the garden, and bringing up their children. But he soon told her that politics was the most important business in the country, and that he wasn't suited to the law. As he put it, I fear, abhor, detest, despise, and loathe litigation. So that pretty much did it. Frances, unfortunately for both of them, loathed politics. She especially hated the capital, a southern city where slavery was legal, and children were led in chains down the malls. You, she could see them every day to, when she was there to one of the city's jails before being sold at auction. So that's one of the, one of the jails. Henry had one condition when he agreed to her staying in Auburn and he moved to Washington. She had to come down to serve as his hostess once a year during the city's social season when he threw very lavish parties for politicians and journalists and the entire social elite. Several times a week, 10 course dinners. So she did that. Each year, she stayed with him during the winter months, spending most of her time doing just chores that she absolutely hated, drawing up guest lists, planning these menus, uh, shopping for provisions. And she was revolted by the contrast between the life she was living with Henry and the enslaved people she saw all the time. So these slides give you a sense of what she considered, which was, was her enforced social life. It's, she had no interest in clothes, but had to dress formally in the morning for visiting and receiving guests, much like these women, and even more so each evening with a braided bun, corsets reinforced with light steel, and enormous hoop skirts, and then exchanging pleasantries with Henry's guests for hours and hours. He loved trading barbs with northern and southern colleagues. He and his enemies talked freely at these dinners. She found it difficult to talk to people she didn't agree with. She wrote to Lizette during her first winter there, it is the life to which I am doomed. No wonder she had headaches and depression. <laughs> it took her nine years to figure out that she could stand up to Henry and not do it anymore, and, and, and even you know, realize that it was possible. Even in Auburn, she had only one friend who shared her passionate support for women's rights and her opposition to slavery, 
And that is Mar Martha Coffin Wright. So she looks so demure, uh, but she was a born rebel. Even so, it took her two years to break out of her constraints. Martha's da husband, David, was a local lawyer whom she envied for his stimulating work and his freedom to travel. She loved reading his law bo books when she had time. By the mid-1840s, Martha had six small children, and she could barely get out the door. Unlike Frances, who was an aristocrat and had a house full of servants to clean and cook and take care of the children, Martha over oversaw a very tight budget in the early years, and she did all of the housework herself, which was a lot. She wrote letters, too, and she was a great correspondent, correspondent to her much older sister, whom you probably have heard of, the infamous Quaker minister and human rights activist Lucretia Mott. Lucretia lived in Philadelphia, where she was a leader in the abolitionist movement and socialized with other radicals, white and black. And she, she did not, she was not, she did not get about in what was called polite society because she was persona non grata. You didn't socialize with black people. Martha wrote wearily in one letter, the only way is to grub and work and sweep and dust and wash and dress children and make gingerbread and patch and darn. Just bathing three of the youngest children took her three hours one afternoon. When she could slip out, she stopped by Frances's house to borrow incendiary books and pamphlets and to talk. She had, she had stopped school when she was 15, as most girls did at the time, if they went to school at all. They vented about their frustrations with their children and husbands and, of course, discussed their subversive beliefs. Frances really admired Lucretia Mott, who described Quakers as agitators, disturbers of the peace, and traveled around the country giving fiery talks defying the social prohibition against women speaking at all in public. And Martha increasingly modeled herself on Lucretia. In 1843, she followed her example, joining the Underground Railroad by turning her basement kitchen into a haven for fugitive slaves. Once Frances' father died and she inherited the house, she did the same thing. They found that this particular activity was a very satisfying way to enact at least one of their beliefs. They were breaking the law and risking heavy fines and prison, even a prison sentence. William Seward encouraged Frances's activism, at least in Auburn. She wasn't allowed to speak up in Washington, but she, she, he, he allowed her to do what she wanted when she was in Auburn. So on one rare occasion when she was away and he was there, he, he wrote to her in wonder, the Underground Railroad works wonderfully. Two passengers came here last night. Martha was really angry that, the North, uh, that women in the North were subjected to what was essentially a form of house arrest, but she also had a biting sense of humor. She practiced Quakerism at home, instilling her beliefs in her children as she saw fit, but because she didn't take them to church, her conservative neighbors branded her an infidel. When young men staying at the August Auburn Theological Seminary came to the door to proselytize, warning her about the fate of children who didn't devote Sundays to God, she replied that she didn't believe in forcing her family to read the Bible. She also kept a stack of American Anti-Slavery Society pamphlets by the front door, telling the seminarians that she would only read their tracts if they would read hers. She wrote to Lucretia, these ascetics give religion such a repulsive character, I wonder who was ever made better by the perusal of such nonsense. William Seward believed, at least nominally, in women's rights, but David Wright emphatically did not. Martha made all of the family clothes, and when they, there were no sewing machines, needless to say, and when they finally, and imagine, six children, her husband, her own clothes, and when they finally had enough money to hire a seamstress, she told David that it was unjust to pay Miss Soule half of what they paid the man who helped him with his outdoor chores. Women should have the same right to save up for old age when they could no longer work. David replied that equal wages would be a curse to the community. And Martha wrote to Lucretia, he refused to argue any more. He went off in a huff to hoe his corn or cut asparagus. Now, she was almost 125 years ahead of her time on this subject. 
It wasn't until 1963 that Congress got around to passing the Equal Pay Act, and most women still don't earn what men do. In July 1848, Martha finally went public with her grievances. She was 41 and pregnant with her seventh child, also a grandmother. It was a baby she didn't want. At a gathering in Waterloo, Martha, Lucretia, and three other women, Jane Hunt, Marion McClintock, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, really started going on about these injustices, and they agreed that they could no longer abide by the laws that men had created to keep women in their place, and they organized the Seneca Falls Convention. There they are in a sketch. I read a lot of scholarly accounts of Seneca Falls, the, the first public gathering devoted solely to women's rights, but I wanted to write a narrative history focused on Martha, and there was plenty of material there, actually, I found. Over the two days of the convention, Martha befriended two people who changed her life utterly. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a couple years younger than she was, with her own young children, and the world-famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass. Stanton was the driving force at Seneca Falls, insisting that the right to vote should be among the women's demands. Lucretia, who had been an activist for a very long time, thought that was a really bad idea and that women would only hurt their cause by pressing for a goal that was considered completely laughable. And she told Stanton, Lizzie, that will make the convention ridiculous. But Stanton got her way, as she usually did. The organizers personally invited Douglas, who was known to be very uh, pro-women's rights, and he had just started his uh, newspaper, The North Star, in Rochester. Martha knew all about him, of course. She read all the abolitionist newspapers, and she made sure to get to know him. He wrote in his report of Seneca Falls, there can be no reason in the world for denying women the exercise of the elective franchise. And Martha, for the first time, went against her older sister. She ended up agreeing with Stanton and Douglas. And they saw the, the, the power, the hidden power in Martha. Stanton immediately enlisted Martha in the incipient women's rights movement, and Douglas drew her further into abolition. He regularly gave talks across New York State, and Martha invited him to the house whenever, whenever he was in the area. After one of his visits, Martha attended a bridal party in Auburn, where she wrote to Lucretia, she was asked with the slightest possible sneer after our recent guests. You know, the, the racism was pervasive. And again, this was a very conservative uh, town, with the exception of little pockets. The women wished to be informed whether we gave them the best room. She replied, certainly. At another party, Martha overheard two guests gossiping. One asked, who is that fine-looking lady? The other replied, that is Mrs. David Wright. She is a very dangerous woman. And she was. By their, by their lies, she was very dangerous. And that brings us to Harriet Tubman. I found her story more challenging despite her fame and some really excellent work in recent years by scholars. Because again, I wanted to tell a more intimate history. And for Tubman, I wanted to bring her off her pedestal and, and, and infuse her with some, some real liveliness. You know, who was she? How did she think? What was she like? By the time Harriet and Martha, by the time Harriet met Martha and Francis early in the 1850s, they were completely insurgents, ready to help the causes of women's rights and abolition in any way they could. Tubman had liberated herself in 1849 when she learned she was to be sold. Her free husband, John Tubman, and two of her brothers refused to join her, terrified that they would be caught and possibly torn apart by bloodhounds, which was a common fate of pe more people got caught than not when they tried to get away. So Harriet walked alone almost 100 miles to Philadelphia, where she was assisted by the city's vigilance committee, founded by Lucretia Mott's friend, Robert Purvis, to help fugitive slaves. And that was a, those committees were then formed in uh, many of the towns and cities across the North, including Auburn. Purvis commented, I love this, that Lucretia was the most belligerent pacifist he ever saw. 
she said of that descri description, I glory in it. As Harriet began to plot a series of incursions into the Eastern Shore to free her family and friends, she met Lucretia. The young Methodist, that was Harriet, and the older Quaker, Lucretia, had a lot in common, actually, their, their political beliefs, and they were convinced that they were directly guided by the voice of God. Abolitionists depended on trustworthy associates in slave and free states, and Harriet set out to expand her network of contacts in the North. Lucretia introduced Martha to Harriet during one of Martha's family visits to Philadelphia, and Martha then introduced Harriet to Francis in Auburn. So you can begin to see how these networks worked. And again, people had to be completely trustworthy. So this was very helpful to have these contacts right in the middle of New York State uh, on the way to Canada. And so Martha, she would then Harriet would stop at the, the, the basement havens of these two women and got to know them both very well. So, and this is the kind of history I just love to tell you, zooming in on individual people and showing, in this case at least, how social change is actually made. Frances and Martha, basically like everyone who listened to her, were transfixed by the story of Harriet's life. Whatever their frustrations with their husbands, it would never have occurred to them to leave them and strike out on their own in a completely different part of the country. Harriet had made that solitary walk to Philadelphia, expecting that when she returned to Maryland, John Tubman would accompany her back north, seeing that she had made a success of it. Instead, she discovered when she got down there, he had taken another wife. That was two years later, and she was completely crushed. She told a friend in Boston that she wanted to go right in and make all the trouble she could, but she thought better of it, and she said she dropped him out of her heart. She just had this, so, so her friends wrote down a lot of what she said, and she just had this amazing way of speaking and thinking, and, and this indomitable spirit. So he wouldn't go with her. She took other passage, passengers away with her instead. And that was the start of her decade as a guerrilla operative. Harriet couldn't read or write, so I didn't have the resources that I did in the letters of the other two. So I struggled to find the right voice in those sections and finally concluded, thinking about her incredible skills as a strategist, that she had purposefully left behind her own oral history. So I pieced her story together from this great academic work and from contemporaneous accounts of what she told others. And she told the same stories repeatedly, and they were very consistent. And first she started out privately, and then as the 1850s went on and it became a little safer to speak in public, especially in Boston, she got to know all of the wealthy abolitionists there. Um, she, she used her public speaking as a way to raise money for her trips to Maryland. Harriet couldn't remember her oldest sister, who was sold when she was three years old. Two other sisters had been leased away by their enslaver as their mother, mother pleaded for mercy and she had recurrent nightmares about that scene, which she could remember. Imagine how this story affected Francis and Martha with their really close ties to their sisters. Harriet had scars on her neck from whippings by a sadistic woman who thrashed her for failing to do her chores properly. She had periodic blackouts from a head injury she'd suffered when an overseer hurled an iron weight at a, an enslaved man at a dry goods store in, uh, in Maryland, and it hit Harriet instead. The trouble in her head, as she called it, caused her to black out periodically and gave rise to visions that she considered prophetic. During the spring of 1859, Frances decided that she needed to do more to undermine slavery. Martha was organizing conventions for women's rights and for abolition, braving hecklers and mobs. People had a tendency to throw rocks through windows, and if, if conservative clerics were in the audience, they would throw Bibles at the women. Harriet was repeatedly risking her life, making a dozen trips at the end to the Eastern Shore, rescuing even her elderly parents, who were not well, and taking them to St. Catharines, Canada, where she lived with them when she was, was not on one of her missions. Frances really shared Harriet's love of family. Knowing that her parents weren't well and were very unhappy, 
and that they were almost totally dependent on Harriet, Francis decided that Auburn would be a far more convenient location for them. And when her father died, he'd left her quite a bit of land. In 1848, the state legislature had passed the Women, Married Women's Property Act, which came about thanks to the lobbying of early women's rights activists and gave women the rights to their own inheritances. One of the parcels that Francis inherited was about a mile from the Seward House on South Street. Now, historians have always attributed the sale to, to William Seward because it was you know, ostensibly his house. But actually, it was her house. <laughs> and, it, and Harriet Tubman was her friend. He lived in Washington. So it, it's clear that it was Francis, who, to me anyway, who made the decision. And this was really subversive. Women still rarely sold property, let alone to fugitive slaves. And Francis would be flouting fugitive slave, the Fugitive Slave Act just as Henry was beginning a very long-awaited bid for the presidency. This is what he had spent his entire career working for. But she and Henry had been integrating Auburn for years. And again, this was they were ahead of their time. They sold plots of land and frame houses to black families in town because black men in New York State could vote once they had $250 worth of property. So this was a way of helping them, black men anyway, achieve citizenship. And Francis clearly saw this as a natural extension of that undertaking. The Seward's youngest son, Will, uh, helped her, uh, he was just starting a banking career in Auburn, helped Francis draw up the paperwork for the mortgage. And conveniently for Henry, he was away in Europe and uh, Egypt and Palestine when the sale went through. And here's another bit of almost lost history. Martha, at about that time, took in Harriet and six men, women, and children on what turned out to be her final Underground Railroad journey. They were followed closely for much of the way, and that tri trip took more than a month. And this was the middle of the winter. This was not easy. Martha wrote to her spoiled youngest daughter, Ellen, who was at a fancy finishing school in Lenox, Massachusetts, that one woman had held her baby in, the ar in her arms the entire way, while Harriet and the men helped along the other children. Martha wrote, whoops, I lost my letter. OK, sorry, guys. <laughs> Another time. Martha wrote, they walked all night, carrying the little ones, and spread the old comfort on the frozen ground in a thicket where they all hid, while Harriet went out foraging and sometimes could not get back till dark, fearing she would be followed. Francis's Francis's relationship with Harriet made her even more intolerant of the unsavory trade-offs that are necessary in politics. In 1861, after Lincoln was elected president, not Henry, as he had hoped, and he asked Seward to be his secretary of state, Henry gave his final speech in the Senate. You may know that seven slave states had already seceded. And the goal of the incoming administration was not emancipation, but the restoration of the Union. Seward explained in this speech, in political affairs, we cannot always do what seems to us absolutely best. That prompted a scorching letter from Francis, who accused him of abandoning convictions he'd held his entire life. She wrote, compromise is based on the idea that the preservation of the Union is more important than the liberty of nearly four million human beings cannot be right. The war years were momentous for all three women. And because we're in Gettysburg, I'm going to focus on Martha's son, Willie. And there she is with him just before he left for Washington. He almost lost his life here during Pickett's charge. Before the, I have to say that before the war began, Martha had abandoned her Quaker pacifism. Lucretia hadn't, but she wrote to Lucretia, I admit that I don't quite take in the philosophy of non-resistance, that, that's pacifism, saying that she thought the carnal sword was more effective sometimes than the sword of the spirit. If you perish by it, never mind, if you thereby win freedom for a race. So you can see how these people thought. They really lived their beliefs. These women were sending their sons into, onto the, you know, right to the front lines. Martha couldn't have been prouder when Willie was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Auburn First Independent Battery of Light Artillery and left for Washington. And when, when he left, she said she told him to die before ever helping to return a slave to the South. He was only 20 years old. 
and the, the, the Wrights had lost their other sons, Charlie, at age one in 1849, the baby she was pregnant with at Seneca Falls, and their eldest, Tallman, who drowned when he was 22. Northern, Northerners had assumed that the war would be brief, almost bloodless. Instead, as you probably know, the Union suffered one devastating defeat after another. Uh, and two years later, General Robert E. Lee seemed completely unstoppable. He had beaten George McClellan, the first commander of the Union's Army of the Potomac, at the Seven Days Battles, John Pope at the Battle of Bull Run, Ambrose Burnside at Fredericksburg, and Joseph Hooker at Chancellorsville. I think I've got those right. Okay. <laughs> Lee had been forced out of Maryland in the Battle of Antietam, but Lee's army had invaded Pennsylvania, and Major General George Meade, who had only just replaced Hooker, was calling for reinforcements. Martha and David knew that Willie would be among those sent. On June 25th, Willie wrote in his diary, his battery began a forced march from Manassas, about 100 miles south of Gettysburg. The men rested on July 1st, the first day of fighting here, and started again at 9 p.m., arriving 18 hours later after a few 10-minute stops for coffee. Early in the morning, villagers stood by the road with buckets of water and bread, and the soldiers took sips and pieces of bread without breaking stride. 18 hours. That's called a forced march. Lee's troops had forced Union men through the streets to a defensive position on Cemetery Hill, south of town. On Friday, July 3rd, Willie wrote, Morning cloudy and cool, received orders and started at 4.30 a.m., came in to park in rear of Cemetery Hill, then ordered to the front. They stopped just behind the line of battle in a small wood. His battery, led by 21-year-old Andrew Cowan, had been ordered to join the Army's Second Corps at Cemetery Ridge, north of Little Round Top, overlooking a grove of peach trees. That's the group, and Cowan is on the far left, and that's Willie standing by the pole of the tent. I want to read to you just a little bit about what happened next, just before Pickett's charge at the, at the site on the battlefield that's now known as the high water mark of the Confederacy. And I found this description, which I'm going to be reading to you. Um, much of what I, much of what I what I wrote uh, came from I found in the archive where uh, Martha's letters are found, and it's just a handwritten account. There you go, um, unsigned. We don't know who wrote it, by just by we know it's by a member of Cowan's battery, and as far as I know. His account has never been told. So this is really exciting when you're doing your research and you just come across this thing. And I, I sent it to Wayne. I said, have you ever seen this before? He hadn't seen it. Anyway, if anybody recognizes it, let me know. The clouds lifted, and the Auburn men were so close to a rebel battery that they could see the sun's rays flash on the brass buttons of enemy cannoneers lounging around their guns. As the morning wore on, still windless and increasingly hot, Cowan's horses stood motionless in their heavy harness, harnesses. Nearby, wild hogs feasted on the mangled carcasses of soldiers killed the previous day. The minty aroma of pennyroyal permeated the air. Willie Wright and a companion caught some sleep in the shade. This, and so this Auburn man who wrote this account wrote, it was like a calm Sabbath day in some village. The two armies lay like tigers waiting for a victim. At one o'clock on July 3rd, a mile west, the initial bombardment from re rebel artillery commenced. For two hours, exploding shells caused a booming and screeching that was said to be heard in Baltimore, 52 miles away. Shells poured from 100 guns pouring from a hundred guns, crashed through the trees, ripping off enormous branches and tearing up the ground. Cowan's men moved to their posts under terrific fire and a burning sun. The Confederates attacked the Union's left flank at Little Round Top, the wheat field, Devil's Den, and the Peach Orchard. The Union men suffered heavy casualties, but they held their position as the rebels charged their right flank at Culp's Hill and Cemetery Hill. 
Willie's battery on the other side of the ridge with reserves and an ambulance unit waited for orders to engage. He could feel the ground rock beneath him, noting most of the shells passed over the troops and came crashing around us in the woods. The exchange of fire ceased in mid-afternoon. That's the battery. During the lull, the reserve artery, artillery guns were ordered to the front and men took their places so low to the ground and so veiled in smoke that an observer would not have guessed that an army was spread across the hillside. The Auburn battery was moved south on the ridge to replace a Rhode Island light artillery battery that had been virtually expunged. The position put them at the center of the rebel offensive in one of the pivotal battles of the war. The commanding officer rode down the line, order, ordering the batteries to hold their fire until the Confederates drew near. Okay, so that is the Confederates. On Lee's order, his second in command, General James Longstreet, reluctantly coordinated a risky frontal assault against the Union line, which stretched for half a mile across Cemetery Ridge. The attack began at about 3 p.m. As 12,500 rebels, led by Major General George Pickett, advanced in two lines in parade ground formation, a company captain in the 118th Pennsylvania Infantry, in reserve near Big Round Top, wrote to his aunt, it was a beautiful sight to see as far as the eye could reach, regiment after regiment, with colors unfurled upon a line as straight as a die. The Union men could hear the piercing rebel yell above the cannon fire. The Auburn man wrote, it was a glorious spectacle. And then he quoted from a, a poem about the Battle of Waterloo and continued, "'Twas worth 10 years of peaceful life to witness such a sight. On they came at sharp double quick and all the guns in that crest of hills poured upon their ranks a terrible rain of shrapnel shell and solid shot plowing great furrows through the living lines so bravely rushing to death. Some of the infantrymen crouched behind a stone wall in front of the battery had a less inspired reaction. Fearing certain death, they abandoned their positions. Willie's captain, Cowan, wrote in his accounts of the account of the battle that their corporal swore at them like a pirate and pranced like a mad bull, smashing a large tin coffee pot over one soldier's head. Cowan ordered the battery to switch to canister rounds for close fire, close range firing. And when the rebels got within 30 yards, Willie waved his cap and called, give it to him. They blew holes in the approaching ranks, but the rebels closed up and came on. At 10 yards, with little ammunition left, Cowan ordered the men to load the guns with double charges of canister for the final round. I'm going to stop there. You'll have to read the book to see what happened <laughs> to Willie. Um, or just go stand uh, on the field at Cemetery Ridge, which isn't far from here at all, just gaze across the field and take a look at the monument there. This is the bas relief on one side. On the other side, it reads, in part, Cowan's first New York artillery, sorry, Cowan's first New York battery artillery brigade, 6th Corps, double canister at 10 yards, July 3rd, 1863. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take questions.